Hi, everyone. This is Jesse from Ripple. Thanks, Zach. Uh, well, it, it's really exciting to be here with Dr. Paul Marciano today. Um, he's a leading authority on employee engagement and retention. Uh, Dr. Paul has over 20 years of experience in organizational development. He's founded a uh, human relations consulting firm. Uh, it's called Whiteboard LLC. He earned his Ph.D. in clinical psychology from Yale University and has served on the faculties of Davidson College and Princeton University, um, where he's taught courses in leadership, uh, industrial organizational psychology, uh, survey development, and much more. Uh, so it's uh, really exciting that, uh, that Dr. Paul's here with us today. Um, he's also the author of the book, Carrots and Sticks Don't Work, uh, Build a Culture of Employee Engagement with the Principles of Respect, and that's RESPECT in all caps, and you'll learn why soon. Um, in his book, Dr. Paul provides dozens of real-world case studies um, and easy-to-deploy strategies to increase employee engagement um, with an added benefit of re reducing turnover uh, in your organization. So we're going to learn um, uh, quite a bit about these strategies today, uh, and hopefully that inspires uh, you know, quite, a, quite a few questions from you all. Employee engagement and retention are two very important sources of inspiration behind our social performance platform here at Ripple. Uh, with, with work becoming so much faster and more social, uh, people, simply put, they, people have different expectations. Um, they're not afraid to look for new opportunities as well outside of your company if they're not getting what they want. Um, and one of the challenges that we keep hearing, um, working with uh, some, some great companies, really innovative companies um, like Facebook, Guilt Group, and others, um, is that older performance management systems really haven't kept up, and uh, that's really not working for a lot of people. Um, we believe that the key to engagement is doing things like recognizing great work when it happens, uh, not weeks or months later, um, sharing feedback in real time, because that's when it's most useful. You can actually do something about it. Uh, making it easy to collaborate on goals, share achievements, um, and replacing stressful, infrequent performance reviews with lightweight, effective performance summaries. Um, here at Ripple, we call those loops. You can think of Ripple as social meets management best practices, and that's why we pay such close attention to the work of thought leaders like Dr. Paul. Um, we're going to have time for Q&A at the end, but feel free to message uh, the host at any time with questions. Um, and uh, without further ado, over to you, Dr. Paul. Jesse, thank you so much, and it's an honor to uh, be on through Ripple. Um, good morning, afternoon, and good evening. Um, thank you, everybody who has joined today. Last week, I completed a, um, a survey uh, via AOL um, that showed that 71% of employees um, would take another job if offered to them. That is simply extraordinary. Um, the point is that um, we are probably at an all-time low when it comes to engaging our employees. And furthermore, because of the economy, um, people are staying in jobs even though they're disengaged and dissatisfied. So understand, you have a lot of disengaged employees out there that are staying in place. They're not looking to move to other organizations. So this issue of engaging employees is even more critical, and I hope to present to you today a solution, um, and I hope that it is, goes hand in hand with uh, the wonderful products that Ripple has created um, that allow you to do just this. We have an ambitious um, slide presentation day. I do want you to know that it will be available for download. So obviously our greatest asset is around our people. And the question is, are you maximizing their talents? What I find in organizations is that although many people would not tolerate um, something as simple as a piece of equipment to lose its effectiveness, um, we allow this to happen with our personnel. So if you were to buy a copier that was to produce 100 pages in a given minute and it began to produce 50, um, I think that we would address this issue. And yet I find that managers are more and more tolerating poor performance in their organizations. Now, I'm going to talk to you today a lot about um, respect. So Rodney joked about it, and Aretha sang about it, and the great Martin Luther King preached about it. And I'm going to talk to you about it today and the role that it has in employee engagement. So why should we care about respect? Well, the truth is, as um, leaders, what we want to do is to influence others. And when we are respected, we create that power. We gain that power. It would be difficult to think about um, any great leader um, that wasn't highly respected. 
And we can think about situations in which leaders lose respect, and as a result, they lose followers. They lose followers because, again, they're disrespected. So if you want to be somebody who influences others, you have to be respected. There was never a great leader who didn't have followers. And if you want followers, you need to be respected. So let's talk about the relationship between respect and employee productivity. And what I'd like you to think about is actually the first day of a new job. Many of us um, start a day, hopefully, um, with enthusiasm and excitement. You know, people don't show up to work on their first day thinking to themselves, um, boy, I can't wait. Six months from now, I'm just going to hate my team members. I'm going to hate this job. Right? That's not what we do. It would be as though we went on a, on a blind date and said, boy, I'm so excited for this first date. I can't wait. You know, six months from now, there are going to be restraining orders, and it's going to be just awful. Right? We don't do that. We join organizations. We begin relationships with hope and enthusiasm that it will be a good decision. Yet, unfortunately, um, this kind of enthusiasm and engagement um, often wanes, and we end up with folks looking like this and sometimes even ourselves. So the point is that we have employees at Hello. And I, uh, in the book, do refer to one of my um, own uh, work experiences in which, you know, as many of you would on the first day of work, show up early. Um, and again, you're, you're ready um, to be in the game. And then over the course of a very short period of time, um, it was as though I had been inserted into a Dilbert cartoon and my enthusiasm just dropped off a cliff. And it was uh, it really wanted to explore personally why this occurred, um, because I felt as though um, I was somebody that always maintained a good work ethic. Um, my father is a um, first-generation uh, Italian, and we grew up on a horse farm. And the, the um, idea was that my father would say, if you wanted to uh, eat seven days a, w a week, you would uh, work seven days a week. So I was always of this mentality that um, you either had it or you didn't in terms of um, a fixed work ethic versus one that could be influenced by the environment. And what I came to find um, was the following, that here in central New Jersey, um, an oak tree could grow fabulously due to the environment and due to the culture. But in the wrong environment, it would simply wither. So it really is an issue of how do we create an environment that allows our employees to flourish? And you probably, either from personal experience, having been in a position working for a certain manager or supervisor, um, or having seen um, individuals within your organization who, under certain management and leadership, flourish, and under others, simply wither. So we really want to pay attention to how does our environment allow our people to flourish and, in return, maximize their contributions to the organization? So my thesis is that we tend to focus far too much on motivating employees and not nearly enough on the culture that sustains them. We're going to be talking about um, carrots and sticks, traditional reward and recognition programs, and why they don't work. So hopefully this is not you um, getting out of bed in the morning um, only for the carrot. Um, so what do we mean by carrots and sticks? Well, it's the use of rewards and punishments to motivate behavior based on the principles of operant conditioning. And of course, we have um, the originator of um, uh, operant conditioning theory, B.F. Skinner. Um, and if you look just for a moment closely at the, uh, his picture and those of the rats, I often wonder um, if it's any coincidence that he went into this line of work. Now, while it is the case that we sometimes feel as though we're hamsters on a treadmill, um, and it is obviously incredibly important that we do earn food pellets, um, there's an awful lot more to how we engage people. So why programs fail? In the book, I review 20 reasons that traditional reward and recognition programs fail, and here I'll highlight a few of them for you. So the first reason that programs fail is simply because they are programs. Um, I, I would ask you this. For those of you that are out there that have ever been on a diet or perhaps had a friend who was on a diet, um, how long does a diet last? 
And of course, the answer to that is as long as you're on a diet. So traditional programs temporarily change behavior for employees, but they really lead to no long-term consequences. And rewards are simply not necessarily reinforcing to people. Here I have a rather funny example, uh, but I've worked for an organization which this was exactly the case. Even when there are certain um, rewards that seem that they would be very desirable, for example, an extra day of vacation, they actually aren't necessarily reinforcing because most Americans actually don't even take all of their vacation days. As another example, sometimes employees are rewarded by getting another job offer, which may require them to actually move. And oftentimes, um, this is not desirable. So rewards are not necessarily reinforcing. Goals can limit performance. Um, and Mike Krzyzewski, or Coach K um, of Duke University's basketball team, um, has a wonderful quote in which he says, I never have a goal that involves number of wins, never. Um, it would just tend to limit our potential. I'll be working with a um, sales organization on Thursday um, where they have obviously certain goals. Um, but you wouldn't or you'd hope that your sales force just wouldn't get to that goal and then stop. While goals are certainly important, they should be viewed as stepping stones um, for continuous improvement. So you want to be careful that actually goals don't limit your performance. One of the problems with traditional reward and recognition programs um, is that they are often administered um, unequally by various managers. Um, managers obviously have um, a different level of commitment. Um, many feel as though, why should we um, give rewards to employees just for doing their jobs. So you're going to have different levels of engagement depending on the supervisor. Many view these programs as stressful as well. So in reality, there are actually differences in how they're administered. Even if the programs were administered completely uniquely across the organization, the truth is that employees would perceive them differently. It's really a no-win situation. Programs actually foster cheating and destroy teamwork. You can imagine situations in which um, individual top contributors, um, perhaps again in a sales organization, um, are highly compensated and rewarded. And what this can lead people to do um, in some ways as some of um, uh, organizations will do in, in terms of trying to present the best picture to shareholders, um, they will actually manipulate um, some of the data, um, and in some cases I've worked with actually seen um, folks that are supposed to be on the same team um, and collaborating refer to one another as competitors. Um, so clearly uh, this is a, an issue that needs to um, be of concern. Some, um, and by the way, all these slides have quite a bit of research associated with them. Here's one that we've known for a long time, and that is that programs actually reduce creativity and risk-taking in an organization. Um, the classic example, actually, um, from uh, uh, children's literature uh, research is if you have a child who really um, enjoys, um, for example, um, reading books, and you end up giving them uh, a dollar an hour to read, and then you remove that as a reinforcer, they actually no longer um, enjoy um, uh, reading. Um, and also, um, if I were to actually give you um, a task such as the person who reaches this goal in a particular amount of time will receive a reward, um, people tend not to think creatively around that. They may go um, hard and fast in pursuit of that goal. Um, however, they're not going to try any kind of uh, new creative solutions because it's too risky. And actually, as I referred to earlier with the um, boy who was reading, Again, extrinsic reinforcement will reduce intrinsic motivation. Um, if you think about uh, the wonderful example of Tom Sawyer and how he um, increased the value of the task, I think one of the things that organizations don't spend enough time doing is actually um, helping employees to build pride um, in the work that they do, build up the intrinsic motivation. Um, certainly not suggesting that we don't compensate and pay people appropriately. Um, but it turns out that actually the more we compensate people, the more they tie their level of engagement and enthusiasm to the money and actually detract 
Um, it takes away from their feeling of intrinsic motivation around the task. We're going to talk at some length later about this issue, um, but again, we really need to be concerned about increasing the culture um, in the organization, creating a culture of respect and engagement, and programs simply have absolutely no impact when it comes to that. And finally, um, not only are um, reward and recognition programs uh, actually have very little return on investment for organizations, um, they actually will serve to reduce the overall motivation and morale in the workforce. Um, and we'll use the following example. In a very simple way, if we just lump our employees to one of three buckets, um, imagine the yellow bucket being our uh, poor performers and the red our medium performers and then our green our high performers, and you ask the question, um, who is the one, what group is the one that's going to get reinforced and rewarded? Well, of course, it's our top performers. There will be um, relatively little, no impact on the lowest performers, who will just view this as another example of um, disenfra how disenfranchised they are from the organization. The real problem comes in, of course, where we have the middle performers um, who may put forth extra discretionary effort, and then they don't win because, of course, the top performers win. And they actually become less engaged and motivated as a result. And some of you may have had the experience of putting forth um, greater effort um, and then not being recognized for it and the feeling that you might have as a result. So I'm obviously not suggesting that we want to ignore the top contributors. But they're somewhat like a, a student that might come up to me and say, Dr. Marciano, um, I've got a 95 on my paper and I'd like to get 100. Um, that's wonderful. Um, we, we love those students and those kinds of employees. However, in terms of actually increasing um, the overall level of discretionary effort and productivity across your workforce, um, it actually they're not going to be able to contribute or add much. So there needs to be a different solution. Uh, by the way, how do we actually, in most cases, reward our top performers? Um, I, in this uh, wonderful cartoon by Dilbert, I keep increasing their workloads until their performance has become average. Um, so why would anyone try to excel? I use only the finest motivational posters. And um, obviously, sticks don't work either. Um, it's an example, and unfortunately, what I have heard about, I've been in this for over 20 years, I actually have heard there's a, a real uptick in, um, among managers in terms of trying to use sticks. And here's a, a recent um, another cartoon that I found. The woods are full of people who want your job. These days you can't shake a tree without three or four engineers falling out. I'd love to stay and chat, but I need to go motivate the other headcounts. You know, unfortunately, this is not far from the truth and what's happening right now. Um, it actually, I believe, this environment allows for um, managers to um, use the stick to try to, again, drive employee behavior. And we know that um, this leads to um, considerable resentment on the part of employees. And when the economy does begin to turn around or as opportunities present themselves, they are certainly going to look there. The other issue is this, is that when we use a stick on somebody, um, it typically is only effective in the presence of that person. So once that influence um, leaves, literally may walk out of the room, um, behavior is going to decline. What I'd like for you to do, and this um, may come as an odd comment, but I'd like you to just forget all about motivation for um, a moment and really focus on the issue of engagement. So engagement refers to um, a long-standing commitment, dedication, loyalty. You know, when people are dating, you might wake up one morning and say, um, you know, I don't think I'm really motivated to be in this relationship anymore. Now, as somebody who came engaged and now married, that's not a particularly good question to be asking yourself. You know, there are going to be good times and bad times um, in relationships and in organizations. And what we want are individuals who are really in it for the long haul, long haul committed and dedicated. So what is employee engagement? There are a number of different definitions. This is what I refer to it as. Um, a psychological construct, which refers to an individual's commitment to one's organization, work, team, employer, and in this case, patients, if you have, for example, um, a, a medical or clients, and which is demonstrated behaviorally through high levels of discretionary effort. Or, in other words, being fully in the game. So we have the great Pele. Um, and Imagine, if you would, for a moment, 
um, what your organization would look like and the successes that it would have if, in fact, all of your employees were fully in the game. Remember what I said. Um, my belief is actually that employees come to us in this readiness to engage state, ready to be fully in the game. There's been a considerable amount of research over the last decade, um, and the following, um, everything that we care about in terms of organizational vitality is related to this construct of engagement, including productivity and performance, profitability, turnover, absenteeism, and as an example, um, disengaged employees are twice as likely to not show up to work, so a real uh, obvious impact on bottom line. Um, employee fraud, customer satisfaction and loyalty has um, been greatly associated with um, employees' level of engagement. Quality defects greatly reduced when employees are engaged. Safety compliance, much higher with engaged employees. And then also, of course, employee satisfaction, as well as physical and psychological well-being. So again, all of the kinds of issues that are a concern uh, to us in terms of organizational vitality are associated with this issue of engagement in a way that a motivation simply is not. So what is the difference between the two? In just a summary way, we can think about the idea of motivation, more about being externally focused, what's in it for me, the carrot, versus um, engaged, having an internal focus. Um, being motivated, um, being more opportunistic, again, what's in it for me versus being committed, having a short-term view versus a long-term view, being oriented towards self versus organization, having a narrow focus versus a big picture, and then unstable versus stable. And if I just take a moment to explain that a bit further, Imagine that you had a work team um, and you gave them a deadline, let's say 5 o'clock or midnight or some, some such, and um, if they were able to meet that deadline, um, then good things were going to happen for them. Uh, you know, uh, they would be rewarded in some way. They'd greatly satisfy a client. And then um, at the 11th hour, whatever that is, and if I was watching, excuse me, if I was watching, um, or you were watching, observing, you would say that everybody on that team was highly motivated. And then at the 11th hour, something happens. Um, um, you know, a piece of equipment breaks, um, there's missing information, and you realize, the team realizes that there's no way to accomplish their goal in the given time. Then you have two groups of people, those that look on their watch and they say, um, oh, well, we tried, and those that actually say, well, what is it that we can get accomplished? Employees that are engaged are hardy. Um, we know that, in fact, um, they're going to be, you know, environmental stressors, things that are going to come up. Um, if you can use the analogy of being in a ship, um, you know, storms are going to come. Engaged employees are the ones who put their heads down and row harder. Motivated employees are the ones that start looking around for other opportunities. I want to talk to you about levels of engagement. Obviously, engagement is a psychological construct that exists on a continuum, but for the sake of conversation, I want to divide them up into five buckets. The actively disengaged, disengaged, opportunistic, engaged and actively engaged. And I like to describe them as follows. Those that are in the actively disengaged category are those that create the problems in your organization. Um, these are the ones who literally, by the way, you know, leave the spill coffee at the coffee maker and don't clean it up. Um, these are the folks that are giving misinformation to their team members um, and to your clients. Um, in the worst case, they're sabotaging the organization, committing um, thievery. Um, and these are the ones who are telling others what a terrible place this is and what a terrible supervisor they have. They are toxic. They are the proverbial bad apples. Um, those that are in the disengaged category, if they were to walk by some sort of a problem, perhaps see a team member struggling, um, they would simply say, you know, not my job, you know, not of my concern, um, and they would simply keep walking. Those that are referred to as opportunistic, um, ideally they want to fly um, under the radar until there may be an opportunity for them to look good. So imagine that they're walking past some problem or situation, um, and actually their boss um, all of a sudden shows up, and that person jumps in and says, oh, um, yeah, sure, I would be happy to help with that project because, um, there's again, it'll make me look good. Those that are in the engaged category are um, – they're coming in, they're the you know, people who are making your organization run every day, they're doing their job. 
if somebody asks them to help, they will um, be more than happy to do that. So you're good, solid contributors. And then there are those that are in the actively engaged category. Those are the ones that are proactive. They take the initiative, initiative to fix and prevent things. There's that old story about somebody who comes in and there's a puddle on the floor and they wipe it up and the next day they wipe it up and then one day they look up and they fix the ceiling. So these are the people that actually fix things in your organization and advance things. Imagine a client, a customer that was having a problem. They wouldn't just fix it. They would think, how can we help to prevent this from being a problem for other customers? So what would it mean in your organization to actually move that needle? Um, and obviously that is the, the million-dollar question. Um, my answer to that, of course, is not with any kind of traditional programs. So what would it take? How could we accomplish that? Realizing sustainable increases in employee engagement requires impacting the culture of your organization. Culture leads to behavior, and behavior reinforces culture. So you can imagine um, when you first joined your organization, consciously or unconsciously, you looked around, you sniffed around to see um, what the environment was like. Was this the kind of place where um, people very much stayed inside their own silos? Um, or is it where people actually reached out um, across departments to help one another? Um, was it even the kind of place where people showed up to meetings on time or five minutes late or ten minutes later or you know, when the boss showed up? Um, did people work on the weekends? Um, did they make sure to stay until the boss left? So um, what happens is, uh, again, any kind of an organization – um, it could be a church group or your gym even, um, has a particular culture associated with it. That culture then leads to behavior. As an individual, people either um, hopefully naturally fit in, they adapt, um, or they leave the organization um, either of their um, own volition or as a result of obviously being let go. So I want to talk to you today about the RESPECT model. And um, I refer to the RESPECT model as an actionable philosophy which guides and directs behavior. And that may seem like unusual phrasing, but there are actually common examples of that in our everyday life. So my best friend, Wendy, um, is an environmentalist. Um, and she might come into my office on a given day and go through my trash and say, Paul, this is recyclable, and this is recyclable, and this is recyclable. Trust me, she's trained me well over time. Um, Wendy also drives a hybrid vehicle and buys groceries locally. She has a philosophy around how to take care of the environment, and she acts on that philosophy. So it could be um, a, a world religion. All world religion um, have particular philosophies around how um, their followers are supposed to act. So for me, um, the respect model is, is, is just that. It's um, a philosophy around how one acts, how one behaves on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, now, interestingly, several um, months ago, I worked with a young man named Jimmy um, who um, was really intolerable when it came to the respect issue. And I remember um, early on, um, and it was an issue if he was either going to uh, turn around in terms of his behavior or get fired. Um, we went out and happened to grab a cup of coffee, and he was um, extremely um, discourteous to the uh, waitress. And I, I said to him, you know, Jimmy, what was that? And it was as though a light bulb came up and said, oh, you mean I'm supposed to respect everybody? Uh, yes, that is the idea. Um, we respect everybody, um, and it's about who we are, um, not because it's something that we do. So consider as we go through this what it would be like in your organization if um, individuals, um, because of the culture of that environment, treated one another, um, whether they were team members, subordinates, um, uh, superiors, um, and customers and vendors with respect. Um, what I would like for you to do um, is to um, think about a time when you really respected the organization that you work for. You respected its mission, its vision, its values, its goals, and objectives. You were proud to tell people that you worked for this organization. A time in your life when you respected the supervisor of that organization, it's your supervisor, you viewed him or her as somebody who was there to grow you, support you, guide you, develop you, give you a pat on the back when you deserved it, and a kick in the butt when you needed it. A time in your life when you respected your fellow team members. Everybody was pulling in the same direction. They were confident. They were meeting their objectives and goals and collaborating with one another. A time in your life when you respected the work that you did. You viewed it as valuable and meaningful. Um, it's something that challenged you personally um, and, again, contributed to the benefit of your organization and your clients.
You were proud of the work that you did. And then a time when you felt respected as an individual within your organization. You were compensated appropriately. Um, your opinions and ideas mattered. Um, so you felt walking in the door respected. Now, if anybody is in a, um, a job right now, um, and I call this the circle of respect, they can answer true um, to each one of those questions. Um, and if I was in a live audience, I would ask how many people exist within that circle of respect in their current jobs. Um, perhaps uh, three or four might raise their hand out of 100. Um, and they always have a smile on their face. And when asked, um, what is it like to go to work, um, it is not a four-letter word. They actually enjoy and look forward to the experience because they know that they're going to be making a contribution, feel good about that, and be recognized for it. If anybody is a Yankees fan, there was a, um, I found this a wonderful quote in the paper recently. Um, Posada, the catcher for the Yankees, felt disrespected about being bumped to the ninth spot in the lineup. Um, which is uh, the, we're on a worse spot to be in batting. Um, he then told Girardi he couldn't play. So literally what happens is that when people feel disrespected in their organization, they take their toys and go home. They disengage. And when that happens, teams lose. In this particular case, playing Boston, Boston won 6 to nothing. Now let's talk about the respect drivers. So fortunately for me, as I did my research, um, respect turned into an acronym. Um, some quotes, a pat on the back is only a few vertebrae removed from a kick in the pants, but it's miles ahead in results. Um, you know, there's no more clear finding in all of uh, psychological research than that um, reinforcing somebody um, using social praise is incredibly powerful. Um, the problem is that our brains aren't wired to pick up on what's working. Um, they're wired to pick up on what's not working. So we often will pay attention, again, to the employees that are causing us trouble and actually fail to acknowledge the employees that are um, most benefiting our company. We tend to ignore them. We tend to take them for granted. And I'll give you um, the, the very problematic about that is when we, when we do that, um, when we fail to recognize good behavior, it often leads to a decrease um, of that behavior going forward. Um, and there's a, a joke I tell, which hopefully you'll always remember, which is um, that your spouse, um, imagine for the ladies out there, your, your partner, your spouse, um, brings you home a uh, dozen long stem red roses. And for the men in the audience, your, your spouse, your partner, says uh, nothing to you. Um, when is the next time that you're going to bring flowers home? And as a gentleman in a presentation in Alabama shouted out, at her grave site, so the truth is that, again, we fail to recognize behavior, that behavior goes away. Jesse mentioned in the beginning that one of the things that I wanted to focus on were real turnkey solutions to help managers at every level. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. Again, the slides will be available to you and certainly would encourage you to purchase the book if you have interest as well. So some of the turnkey solutions are simply sending a handwritten note um, the cheapest, most powerful thing you can do, and send it home. Um, spreading the word. When somebody does a good job, let your boss know um, and ask him or her to actually contact that individual and let them know that they've heard the good news. You might hold that person's work up as an example to others, um, letting them know that this is exactly um, what's going to um, be the greatest benefit to the company. Um, obviously, increasing decision-making and autonomy is a way that we recognize and acknowledge people. Creating more opportunities for them. Um, again, this should be a conversation, not a one-way dump or delegation, but really asking the person, um, you know, given the contributions that you've made, I'd like to give you additional opportunities. What, what is it that you would like to be able to do? You know, we often document, um, of course, poor performance in personnel files. What about um, uh, actually documenting um, excellent performance? Now, empowerment. Um, so empowering employees, the most vital task of the leader is to motivate, inspire, empower, and encourage the team's primary resource, the unlimited creative human potential to find better ways. Um, you may be an incredibly competent employee, but if you don't have the tools and resources you need in order to um, be successful, um, it's going to be a very frustrating and very disengaging experience for you. And there are obviously lots of different kinds of resources, perhaps the most important of which is just ongoing communication. Some of the turnkey so, um, solutions associated with empowerment creating powerful onboarding procedures and new hire training programs, setting employees up for success. 
asking employees how you can reduce barriers to help them do their jobs better, increasing level of cross-training, or at least shadowing, in other words, at least on some regular basis, having people observe um, their team members and those in other departments, increasing the flow of communication. Um, and there are obviously many different forms. This is one of the reasons that I am so impressed with Ripple and what it has to contribute. Um, and again, creating learning opportunities for the individual. Now, supportive feedback. No one enjoys addressing others' deficiencies, but failure to do so sends the message that people are on track when they really aren't. And that may be the greatest disservice a leader can do to somebody. I have gotten entirely away from the idea of um, using quote unquote negative feedback. I've never found a manager who particularly enjoyed delivering negative feedback or an employee who um, enjoyed receiving it. Um, all feedback should be delivered in a manner that it is supportive. If I care about an employee um, being um, successful, um, I'm going to provide them with ongoing coaching and mentoring. If um, you wait until the performance review period to deliver that kind of feedback, it is highly ineffective, disrespectful. Um, it just doesn't work. Um, yet another example that, again, I am attracted to um, the Ripple product um, because of its ability to provide this ongoing um, coaching to employees. So some turnkey solutions around this. Um, want to always make sure to focus on behavior and the impact of that behavior, not on attitude. You want to utilize coaching moments and quick feedback, either, again, either virtually or in person. Add role play to supplement verbal comments. Um, people hear comments. What makes them stick is actually engaging in that behavior. Schedule time on the calendar. Again, we're often... Um, especially as we begin um, um, changing our own behaviors, um, we need prompts, and simply adding um, those events on the calendar can help. Um, you want to be selective. You don't want to, as you begin this process, to overwhelm um, your employees. So be selective in what you want to focus on. Serve as a role model, actually, and ask your employees to provide feedback with you, really a critical first step. Partnering. Um, so in the past, a leader was the boss. Today's leaders must be partners with their people. Um, this is about developing collaborative working relationships um, with individuals, first on the one-on-one -on -one level, um, then with among team members, across departments, and then with customers and vendors. So we show great respect to our employees when, again, we create this partnering as opposed to hierarchical kind of um, organization and relationship. So partnering, um, one of the things that I think is particularly um, valuable is conducting an internal service audit or survey in which we actually ask our internal customers, um, how are we doing? How can we help you um, better to serve you? That's at the um, department to department level. Um, developing a mentoring program to support individual growth. Create um, an employee council to provide feedback. Increase communication through, again, various means, such as tall, town hall meetings and weekly newsletters, a company blog. Um, eliminating any kind of differences in benefits and perks. And many organizations, I'm, I'm happy to say, are moving more toward this, getting rid of those executive parking spaces or differential health care or, or even company cars. When you do this, um, employee sense of respect um, for themselves and for the um, executives goes up tremendously. Setting clear expectations. Set your expectations high. Find men and women whose integrity and values you respect. Get their agreement on a course of action and give them your ultimate trust. Some of you may be wondering why I have a picture of Dorothy down there. Well, um, for me, most managers, when they set expectations and those aren't met, there's a problem. Um, what I find is um, instead of addressing the issue quickly, they'll actually uh, close their eyes and click their heels three times and hope that it goes away. Um, and, of course, it does not. Behavior that is not consequated is then by default reinforced for the employee and continues. So um, when it comes to setting expectations, um, it needs to be clear. People need to be held accountable. Some of the things that you can do um, are to make sure right from the very beginning, giving job candidates the real deal, you want to set their expectations. Um, some of you may have ended up in a job in which um, you were sold on one thing, and once you got into it, it looked very, very different. Set clear and consistent and challenging goals. Obviously, many of you are familiar with the idea of SMART goals. Uh, make sure to document expectations to ensure common understanding and hold others accountable. Don't just um, give somebody, even if it's a minor kind of expectation, and ask them, do you got it? Because they will say, I got it. 
and they don't often. You want to be able to put checkpoints in place, especially early on. You want to make sure that people are on the right track. Um, if you're heading off on vacation um, it's, and you want to go 95 south, where I am, and you go 95 north, it's not too good. So again, right at the beginning, and when you have, again, the kind of um, platform that Ripple does, it um, really increases the likelihood that people are going to stay on track. One of the things that's really interesting is as a supervisor, meet with your individual employees and just sit down and ask them to actually write out a list of what they think their expectations are for you. And it's really quite remarkable how different those can be. Um, and even if they're similar, the priority of them are often quite different. Consequent behavior early. Um, so one of the things that I will say is I'm um, confused and concerned. Um, I'll say I'm confused because it does not seem uh, as though the expectation has been met, and I'm concerned about that and want to understand why that's the case. And this style is in very much contrast to the idea that um, we're going to attack people and accuse them and blame them and treat them as incompetent and make them defensive. And again, you know, setting clear expectations and holding people accountable, really, really critical. So demonstrating consideration, people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, we know that individuals join companies because of the company and leave people because of individual supervisors. Um, nothing is going to engage employees more than when they are treated with consideration. The first thing is that you have to know who your employees are. You actually have to have conversations with them. I realize that sometimes there's a fine line between becoming too personal, but even at a kind of a superficial level, knowing what their interests are allows you to create um, actually operation um, situations in which you're considerate. Obviously, being on time and following up promptly. Regularly asking employees for their opinions and ideas. Now, don't do that if you're not planning on uh, actually following up or acknowledging them. Creating flexibility more and more in this generation, that's what they're looking for. Keeping people in the information loop, um, asking them, if, for example, they like to be copied on emails or join meetings. We all know what it's like when we feel like we've been left out of that communication loop. Making sure to give people your full attention. Um, some of you may out there ha may have conversations with your own boss um, while they're simultaneously checking their BlackBerry or typing emails. Um, very disengaging. And finally, um, in the acronym TRUST, leadership without mutual trust is a contradiction in terms. And I think about trust as this kind of personal relationship where um, over time we put nickels and quarters and pennies and dimes into a bank, um, and it's very fragile, right? If we drop it, if something happens to break trust, um, it really shatters, and it's um, very difficult to uh, reassemble, um, and it's never quite the same. So some things around trust, we want to make sure to avoid micromanaging, really, really critical issue. Um, much different um, experience having a, a supervisor that's always looking your, over your shoulder, checking your work, um, communicating to you that um, you're not actually trusted. Versus when a supervisor hands somebody off the proverbial ball and says, there's the goal, I trust you to get us there, and by the way, I'm here to provide support. Um, making sure, obviously, to keep your promises, and when you don't actually acknowledge and owning up to that, um, owning up to your mistakes, talking to people, not about people. Um, being honest and direct, the more honest and direct, um, the more people know they can trust you. Um, obviously, increasing the level of autonomy for an individual strongly communicates trust. Walking the talk, not saying one thing and doing another. Now, engagement is an, in a new virtual world with a new workforce and new technology. Technology is for a virtual workforce. So there are three factors that are important to consider. We need technology that facilitates social interaction and decreases psychological distance among employees, managers, and team members. The less training, the more intuitive, the better, and people want technology that fits the way they think and how they live. And that's why, again, I am so attracted to Ripple. I'm sure many of you are obviously familiar with the product, and Jesse gave us an overview of that. So just very quickly, Ripple is an engaging social performance platform with email integration that enables users to make performance reviews lightweight and effective, provide continuous feedback. Um, one of the things I think is terrific is actually having an anonymous feedback option that allows for ongoing dialogue. Set, manage, and track goals in the form of such as an internal wiki. Give thanks and recognition tailored to the company culture. Schedule and document um, online one-on-ones. Identify impact of team members' accomplishments. Develop a reputation and personal brand on the, at the employee level. Serve as a repository of feedback and communication. Increase organizational transparency and foster collaboration and personal relationships. 
Um, just some quick screenshots. Again, I would obviously encourage you to get into Ripple um, to communicate and get in contact with them if you want um, more information. But just um, some examples here um, of the kind of feedback that you can send very quickly. Um, Jesse talked about the, the loop, the communication loop. Um, one of my absolute favorite facets of it is the ability to give people badges online for recognition. Um, I think that that is the way we were raised, starting as young children, getting stickers on our um, homework assignments, getting badges and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and going on to football helmets. Uh, you know, at college, we we really get the idea of um, a badge, and they they really make it very fun and meaningful because you're able to apply specific criteria to it. So again, just an overall page um, of what somebody's uh, profile might look like, the kinds of assignments they're working on, the goals they have, um, and the ability to reach out to people. Now, um, if as a result of this talk, um, the idea you've um, kind of come to understand or appreciate the importance of respect and want to get on that journey, um, there's some things you can certainly do in your organization. The first, of course, is a great Gandhi quote, to be the change you want to see in the world. There's nothing like being a role model. The second is I certainly have different instruments that I've used with organizations um, conducting an employee engagement and respect assessment. So on each of those drivers, how does your organization um, measure up and what is the impact of that on engagement? Aligning respect with current mission, vision, and the values. Um, this idea of respect is usually not a tough sell. Many organizations have at least an aspect of respect um, in their um, already supposedly their corporate culture. Obviously, offer different kinds of workshops and talks um, to reinforce the behaviors um, consistent with respect. Um, and then, of course, um, when you're on the playing field, giving that feedback, either positive or making sure to consecrate behaviors consistent with or counter to principles of respect. Um, if people are not behaving in a respectful manner, they need to be held accountable. So at this time, um, with about 10 minutes left, I'm happy to take any questions or discussions. Um, Jesse, I believe you're going to help me with that. Yes, and thanks, uh, Paul. That was awesome. Uh, so uh, I do have a, a couple of questions here um, that have been coming through uh, during the presentation. Um, one is um, asking about the size of the organization. So does the size of the organization matter in terms of applying these techniques? Um, you know, large, small, uh, are they, is it applicable yeah. across both? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons that I actually wrote the book was I understood the importance, um, you know, the smaller the organization, the more important it is that every employee um, contribute at a high level of discretionary effort. Um, so I, I wanted um, so yes, the answer to that is that the kinds of principles apply um, equally. I've worked with small doctor's offices, for example, with a handful of practitioners and staff, um, all the way up to the United States Postal Service, the second largest employer, and uh, companies of every size in between. Um, I would also say that um, it, it, this is a kind of model that's particularly useful in union environments, and if you think about it, oftentimes um, union um, so what they want most of all is respect. Um, you know, I think one of the things that you'll find too is with the, um, the different solutions that I've offered in the book, um, uh, very few of them um, cost any kind of money, um, and yet they are extremely powerful. So um, organizations of any size, depending on their financial resource constraints, can um, apply these techniques. Great. Um, so here's another one. In terms of applying the techniques, uh, your response follows nicely into this next question. Um, so th this individual is relatively new um, in the company and sees some issues with engagement. Um, how do you? What, what's your advice for influencing uh, colleagues, especially new ones? Like how to, how to, how to broker that uh, that conversation? Right. So you know, for me, all of this starts. Um, during the, the hiring process. Actually, I think it starts during the interview process um, in terms of um, letting employees know that um, this is a culture of engagement and respect and what does that actually look like. So again, it's really critical. Um, and I think employers are getting smarter and smarter about this to understand that um, you need people who fit culturally into your organization. Um, you know, you can 
you can teach technical skills. It's a lot easier than trying to teach somebody to fit in with a culture. So, for example, um, I've run a um, small manufacturing company myself for a number of years, um, and when I was interviewing any employees, the first thing that I would hand them would be our vision, our mission, and our guiding philosophical principles. And I would say, um, you know, if, if your own values are inconsistent with anything here, um, this is not going to be a good fit for you in the organization. So I would say that it really starts during the onboarding process and to make sure then that the, the first line supervisors and managers, um, that they really understand and are going to be able to consequent um, the, the behaviors consistent um, with engagement and respect. Um, and actually there are a couple of questions that just came in uh, that, that follow uh, on that response, which is, um, so it's understood you know, you know, how to influence the culture that you work in uh, from the perspective of, say, influencing your employees. Um, but what about upward? Um, so there are a few questions about, uh, for example, uh, influencing executives in the organization if you're not one of them. Um, and uh, one, one of the questions came in from uh, someone at a very large, old-style corporation. Um, how do you influence the executives? And there was another one even from, uh, uh, I guess, what, what's probably a smaller company where the, they had the same issue. Um, how do you, how do you uh, exert that upward influence? Yeah, you know, this is one of the most um, challenging questions, and I, I certainly get this uh, a lot. And you know, if it wasn't challenging, uh, we wouldn't be getting asked it, right? It's 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 um, it's it's difficult. It, it depends a lot on the on the culture. If 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 it's an old, very hierarchical culture. Um, it's obviously um, more difficult. Um, I obviously always try to start at the highest level possible in an organization. Um, there's actually been some really interesting research out recently in the field of neuroscience that shows that those at um, high uh, levels in an organization actually um, have lower levels of social emotional intelligence um, and are less likely to treat others with respect. It's simply a really big blind spot with them. So one of the things that I will frequently do, because you, you, you have to, it's, it's as though you're dealing right with an alcoholic where they say, I don't have a problem. You're not going to get very far. Um, you need to move people along this kind of readiness um, uh, to change uh, spectrum. And so one of the things that I often do um, are conduct uh, anonymous 360-degree instrument um, assessments. Um, and provide um, executives with that kind of feedback. Using the kind of anonymous feature on the Ripple platform is also wonderful. You really want to get the executive to buy into the idea um, that it's important for you um, to engage your own employees with respect. Um, that can be a really good way to um, begin a conversation um, and then to actually identify um, for that individual um, some of the tactics and approaches that you'll be using and then maybe provide an opening to have some conversation around how to improve um, the relationship with you have with that individual. Um, again, it is, it is definitely a challenge. Um, there, there are various kinds of things that you can do, um, and it, it, more than the two minutes we have left, but that would be my short answer. Great. And uh, yeah, I think speaking of time, it looks like we have time for about one more question. Um, and uh, got a couple of questions on this front, which is, uh, around uh, starting out the program, so how do you encourage engagement? How do you basically implement this model when trust in previous engagement activities has been broken? Yeah, right. So that's that's great. So and 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 trust really is the groundwork for this. So without trust, um, don't worry about any of the other drivers or engagement. Um, the first thing that really has to happen here um, is that upper level management has to acknowledge. Um, that the kinds of programs that they've put in um, place um, have been ineffective. So really owning up to it um, and then um, really be the ones to begin um, representing that behavior. So just as one final quick example, working uh, recently with the, um, the owner of a company um, who was about as disrespectful as uh, one can be, um, just training him literally to say good morning to the administrative assistant um, when he walked in. And even though he didn't believe that that was necessary, um, he began engaging in that behavior, and if, believe it or not, um, Jesse, just that behavior um, created such a significantly higher level of engagement with the employee, and it just begins to turn on itself. So um, it really does take the um, leadership of the organization investing in, believing in, um, and really walking the walk and being the change that they want to see in their organization. That, that's great. So, I mean, a, a great way to wrap up um, – 
a, a ton of very valuable uh, insights, advice, and uh, I think personally at least the most exciting uh, aspect of the, the discussion today was how practically applicable everything is. Um, so that brings us to the top of the hour, and I uh, just wanted to thank everyone uh, on the line for, for joining us and uh, asking some really great questions. Um, we will be sharing the slides, and uh, uh, we'll follow up with that information. Uh, also wanted to thank uh, Dr. Paul Marciano again for taking the time to share uh, all of your, your insights uh, with us and um, really just make a make the second part of the day here, the afternoon, that much better with, uh, with some really valuable information that we can apply today. So uh, with that, we'll thank everyone, and thanks, Dr. Paul, and uh, speak with you all again soon.